It's my, my pleasure to be here today. Uh, what an honor to come and, and, and speak at Ohio on corn. I, I'm going to be talking, I'm an agronomist. I came from Illinois. I, I've lived in Nebraska a long time. Uh, worked in Iowa for several years as extension corn. So I'm going to, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, aiming for a perfect ear. So before I get started, I want to hear what you think a perfect ear is. Not, not this kind. Not this kind. But what's a perfect ear of corn look like? 24 round. 40 to 44 long. All right. Does anybody in the seed business can do that? Maybe you're in the seed business. What else? Uh, is that cap uh, I mean, is that captured? Is that a perfect ear? 24 by 40, 44? Yeah. Well, thanks for speaking up. Yeah, so population makes a difference. Does all that make sense? What else do we need to think about for a perfect ear? Is it possible? Is that something that you really want? Perfect ear. 24 around. 40 to 45 long. Is that what you want? I know how you can get it. And you do too. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I, I really think too, I'm going to show you in a few minutes why I think that whole perception for about almost 100 years failed to increase yield because we were looking for that perfect ear. So do you believe me? And after I say all that, I, I'll tell you I found the perfect ear. I think I've got a picture of it coming up here in a minute. Oh, we're in an imperfect world. So that's part of the story too. And I'm going to show you how when we're right at the razor's edge of perfect, of trying to be perfect in everything we say and do, that one misstep when we fall off of that edge and collapse happens. And it did for some of us in Nebraska this year. Some guys lost a third of their yields and some up to half. And we're irrigated, so it's not drought we're talking about here. We're talking about a failure in hybrids and the interaction of environments. So in other words, the impact of weather on the genetics that we had last year. And what our objective is as scientists is trying to get around that, uh, trying to help prevent that same problem from happening in the future. But in the meantime, oh, I didn't, I didn't introduce my, uh, Justin McMechan is a uh, new PhD uh, actually in, in entomology and uh, uh, doctor of plant health at Nebraska. And he and I are working uh, almost hand in hand on all of these things that I'll be talking about here. So, but underneath all this is, is corn growth and development. So that's the way I'm layering this. And what can, how can knowing corn growth and development help us understand uh, how to achieve uh, better yields and better productivity? All in an integrated way like uh, Jonathan was talking about. I'm a firm promoter of, of IPM. There's a perfect year right there. Right there. It was only 20 around, but it was 50 long. 1907, that year was not only the, 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 the champion in Iowa, but the guy got in a train, Pascal's the guy's name, the farmer's name in northeastern Iowa. He carried it to Chicago and it was deemed the world's best year, 1907. It was so famous that they took a picture of it and put it in this uh, front of uh, in front of this book here, and that's uh, next to Podcorn, which at that point, 1907, they thought that was the original uh, parentage of, of, of corn, but it's not. We've learned that over the years. But that is the Paschal ear. Why do you think I got interested in that? I was uh, at Iowa State for about nine years. I was walking into uh, the secretary, the head secretary's office, and. And I looked up on top of her bookshelf, way up high. Is much, uh, you know, I had to get up on her desk. She said, "Just take it, just take it." And guess what it was? It was the Pascal ear. That's it. And it sat at my desk in a trophy case for uh, four or five years before I left Iowa State. So it's in the archives at Iowa State now, if you want to see it, in a trophy case. And that's why I, I started studying on on that what that ear was. Right next to it is a, uh, 
one of our better yielding hybrids in Iowa in 19 or in 2010, and one that Kip Color, Colors produced down in, in southwestern Missouri in 2010. So it's a, it's a perfect ear, but perfection is not always uh, attainable. Not always what we want. It was a lot of. In fact, that could be a picture of the. I saw this on the web last night. Look at the ears. That that's about the size of that fish. No, that ear you were talking about, right there. So there was a lot of hype about larger ear size, and that's the way we were selecting ears uh, and corn hybrids for, for generations, and I think that's why we really didn't improve yields for a long, long time. You knew half the parentage on that hybrid, right, or on that, on that seed, but not the other half. And for that reason, plus 100 other things that happened, uh, until right here we started understanding a lot more about how to grow corn. And I can talk about that at length if you want sometime. Um, but I, I think that's one reason why we didn't improve yields until the 40s. Multiple other ones, but that's one of the reasons, is because we were selecting based on how attractive an ear was. Uh, one of the Wallaces that... Uh, that Oh, which one? There were three Wallaces important in Iowa, and I can't remember which one it was. Uh, Henry uh, was saying, uh, what are looks to a hog? So he was one of the first ones to start thinking about breeding corn, what are looks to a hog? Well, that's what we were doing. We were selecting for beautiful ears like those over there in that painting up until somewhere right in here. Detrimental. And, and so what happens today? Well, we have some tip back problems like this, um, which can be caused by multiple factors. What, what are some of the reasons why you would have tipping back like this? Short of moisture, sure. Population, I think I heard somebody say that. High, too high of populations. Failure of, of the pollen and the silking to neck whatever, and what, the, what we were told here on this hybrid is, in fact, these are the same, same hybrid, the same field, I think that was in Iowa, was that that hybrid always tips back some. So you gotta know the genetics too. But what we have here is a combination of, of aborted kernels, you can see those, those whitish uh, uh, kernels there, and then some, at the very tips, some uh, kernels that were never pollinated at all. So. A little, there are two problems going on in, in, in all three of those ears that you can see there. Failure to, uh, to uh, find the silk and a failure to, uh, and also limited resources, so we, got, we had abortion. And Nebraska is not the only place. This, this was this year just here in Iowa. Peter, it's one of your articles here on some. So we aren't the, uh, the king of ugly looking ears. Uh, happened this year as well. How, how pre pervasive was this? Just small problems, Peter? Or? It, was, it was localized, but we had a lot of localized areas. Okay, lots of localized areas. Not very pretty. And uh, it was, he was, if you're interested in that, there's a, you can go to the, to the newsletter. That's trichodermis, and that's very rare. We, we haven't seen that. It's, here's also a battle, thankfully. Okay. And a rare fungus on top of it is what Peter's talking. And Peter's talking later. You can ask him more about that if you want. And here I'm talking about abnormal ears in Nebraska. And I'm Peter sitting here is the, uh, I won't say you're the king of abnormal ears, but you know more, uh, more about abnormal ears than, than most of us have in, in this poster is everywhere in the world. Uh, so we're going to be talking about a few of these and. and when things fall apart and we don't end up with uh, even what we consider to be part way to perfection. And why is uh, knowing perfection important? You know, uh, uh, my dad's here with me, so introduce yourself to my dad here later on if you want. But we lived in Argentina for a year, my wife and I, and we took three kids with us, and, and dad visited us there, and he has fond memories of that. Well, one thing I learned is a uh, uh, we had to change money about once a month. I go to the money changer and cash my check from Clay Center, Nebraska, and get either uh, either the, the pesos or the uh, or, or U.S. cash uh, because my landlord required U.S. cash. So I'd go there and I'd get four hundred dollar bills. One day I walked into that money changer, 
and, and he would, had a stack of U.S. $100 bills about this big. I'm talking, I'm in the middle of nowhere, Argentina, right? My Spanish isn't too good. But he had a stack that big of $100 bills, and he was going like this, one by one. So I asked him what he, what he was doing in my poor Spanish. What do you think he told me? I, I heard somebody say something. You'll have to speak up. Counterfeits. I, I, I thought he was counting them. No, he said, I'm not counting them. I'm feeling them. Because he was looking for counterfeits. All right, so why, why do I say knowing what perfection is? So this is perfection more in today's term than 1907. But why is knowing perfection important? Knowing what the ear should like, look like so that when we have an issue with, with the corn that we'll know there's a problem. Because you know what the real thing looks like. And that's precisely why, you know, when we put out, I'm sorry, I didn't have this out, but when we put out this at Iowa State when I was there, we put this out with this idea in mind that we want to show the world what the perfect corn should look like. So that when you see a counterfeit, you'll know it right away. So there, there, there's that reason. And when you see a counterfeit, go to the poster and, and the work that Peter's put out, and you'll see uh, what the counterfeits look like. So what we're talking about, the counterfeits that we saw this year are uh, the multiple ears up there. We had barbell ears, which is up there, and then down here some short husks. Anybody ever see? Or maybe maybe we're in such a perfect world out here in Ohio, you never see these kinds of things. But I know better because Peter put that poster together. Has anybody seen any of these multiple ears? On a, on a node, yeah, there, there we go. Uh, barbell ears, anybody see those? A few more nods. How about the short hus? So, it's not a perfect place out here, Peter. Sorry. We had them all this year. I, I've seen a few of those before. I, I'd seen the barbell type things maybe once or twice in my career. I've seen the multiple ears multiple times, no pun intended. Uh, the short house, I'm not sure if I'd seen that before, but we're going to uh, talk briefly about those and how they relate to growth and development of corn. So uh, just a little bit of a, uh, a review here. When we're talking about corn growth and development, we're talking about going from vegetative to developmental stages. And the V stages uh, are based on the number of leaves, and we work on the leaf collar system is the system I'm talking about. There are other systems. The hail industry uses a different format, by the way, a different style. Uh, and then once you get into silking and beyond, we go into the R or reproductive stages, and they, they go one through six. So I'll be, I'll be talking about those uh, and then various things that can happen along the way. Let's see if I can get this to work. One of the... Um, I may have to go off of PowerPoint for a sec. One of the things that that has driven, you know, in terms of a hail storm, what is what is corn safe from hail or frost, for instance? Got an idea on that? What is corn safe from hail or frost? Black layer. <laughs> How about early season? What, what's that? Before the yeah, before the growing point comes out of the ground, which is what V stage? V6? I'll just tell you it's V6. Actually, the place that corn is safe from frost or hail is when it's in the bag in the uh, machine shed. I think that's the only place, really. But watch this, because we, uh, Justin put together a time lapse on hail. Watch how a V4 plant recovers from hail damage. So it's going to hail now. We have a hail machine that we put out. So there's a hailstone coming across right there. This is the plant right after hail. Does it always?
always happen like that? Answer is no. It's not a perfect world. There are times that soft rots come in those and, and destroy, uh, you know, the, the bacterial infections infect the growing point, kill off plants uh, June 3rd, 2014. My first summer ends in Nebraska and we were devastated with hail and some plants recovered and some did not, even though they're V4 to V5. This is a perfect case scenario, not perfect, but the plants do recover. So a lot of our interest in research is trying to figure out um, what the yield loss uh, is on plants like that. And there is some. A live plant is not 100% productive. All right, so let's go through some more here on, on uh, ear development on corn. If you look at it, there's a fancy word that means that the ears initiate from the bottom up. So the lowest node is first, and, 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 uh, and these are stalk nodes. You're looking at a, just a diagram of what the growing point of a corn plant might look like. As you look at a V6 plant, that growing point, like you were saying, is above ground, and, and it's right there. All the leaves are initiated by V6. The tassels initiated by V7. So that entire plant is there ready to go at V7 when you have seven leaves. It's an amazing uh, uh, miracle almost how that works out. The uppermost ear is initiated about V6 also. That's really important as we start thinking about what can happen in terms of the corn plant. So here's some pictures. I think these are Bob Nielsen's that show uh, ear, uh, ear developed at node four. What's unique about node four? It's below ground. So there's some ear development at node four. All right. Uh, not sure what new. Oh, the tassel is initiated there, and you can see it coming out on that diagram over there. The, uh, the interesting part about this is that once that tassel comes out, and that's V6 to V7, the ear development is actually top down after that point. So the ears initiate, bottom up, ear develop, top down. It's a really interesting part of the way the, uh, the, the plant's designed. Uh, ear node uh, on 103 to 118 is usually 13 to 18. And you know Peter talked this morning about early season hybrids. Oftentimes, those things develop ears at a slightly lower node. We don't know why. That's just the way it works. This shows you that bottom up uh, ear uh, elongation uh, route. These are the, these are the ears that. Uh, Leaf seven over here, eight, nine, ten. This would be your uh, primary ear node, and this is at V9. So you got the picture, bottom up. The next picture shows you how the ears develop, top down. Different scales over here, nine and a half inches over here, and three inches over there. So they, you know they aren't quite equivalent. This will be your ear node in a perfect world. Those are uh, images that are out of this book. Gloria Ebendroth uh, helped put those together, just did a fantastic job, I think, but I'm biased too. Uh, at V5, what, if you look at some of the literature on this, uh, 1996, that cold temperatures can affect ear abortion. In other words, if you have cold temperatures at V5, you can lose that primary ear. And um, at V, I guess it's V6. The other thing that uh, you can find, uh, if at V3, you, you can lose a secondary ear, too, if it comes on a little bit earlier. So 41, 50, 50 degrees Fahrenheit at uh, V6 or so, you can lose that primary ear. Also, we, what, what this Lejeune is, a French article, actually, in Bernier, Bernier, 96, said that chilling temperatures with flooding increase that. So if you have flooding and cold temperatures, it increases it, but lower light conditions with cold actually reduce that effect. So put some shade cloth over your plants if you have a cold night. Yeah, we can do that in research. It'd be hard to do in the field. Uh, yield components occur in sequence at key stages. So we'll talk about the yield components and we'll go back. Where, where? I, where, where are you at? I can, I can hear you. Oh, thank you. Uh, our work shows maybe one day, just one night. So, eight hours? Yeah. We're, we're really trying to figure that out. 
right now, but that's what it looks like. One night, maybe two at the most, of 41 to 50 degrees. But it doesn't always happen. But the issues we saw this year in some hybrids with those environments, that's, that's what happened. We're pretty sure of that. The Lejeune work was all lab greenhouse type stuff. What I'm talking to you about now is trying to figure it out what happened in the field last year. So good question. Thanks. Whoops, I didn't talk about that question, that did I? So at V7 is when your row number rows around. You know, we're talking about 24 rows around, and, and the, the Pascal year was 20. Uh, that's, that's determined by V7. And, and you can see this division going on. There's a division here from 1 to 2. So I usually ask people, you know, if I'm in a field and, and I'm counting 14 round here and over here I'm counting 17, what happened? Same field, same hybrid, same planting date, 14 here and 17 here. What, can't, what happened? 14 here, 17 here. Come on, come on. <laughs> Is that possible? No. Why? It's right here. Because we take every single row, this is, uh, I can't see quite where that is on, on, on that V9, we're do, going from one to two. So every, every ovule splits into two, that's not quite the right terminology, I don't think, but, so we always have pairs. But I have been in fields where you have 14 in one part of the field and 16 in the next, or 18. How can that happen? I've always heard that row numbers genetically determined. Is it? Not completely, because I've seen fields like that, and you probably have too. So uh, that, that's that. So you get in that split and, and kernels, and when you have these kinds of ears, and, and uh, Peter, uh, I think the world calls these ear pinching, when you get this kind of uh, thing, look at that. You're going from row, one row down to two. That's what's happening there. You get in a constriction there, and it's often chemically induced. Um, and you can reduce the row number at V7. So at V9, all the leaves and the, and the uh, ear shoots are visible with dissection. You should be able to see them all. At V12, you have the maximum row length. So we're, we're talking 20 or 40 long or 50 long like the Pascal ear. Uh, that was all determined before the V12 stage. That's the maximum number of potential kernels. So is that the number of kernels you're going to harvest? No, there's a lot more that goes on between V12 and, and blister and milk stage, and that's when the potential, the actual kernels are determined at that point. Also, you, you well know that kernels develop from the base of the ear to the tip, so that, that's another sequence of events that's good to know and keep in mind. There's a neat picture there from, uh, from the literature on a V9 ear, ear versus a V12 ear. By V12, all those kernels are already set there. And, and when you get the blunt ear syndrome like that, uh, what's that tell you about? These aren't ones that I'd be proud of, but I brought them along anyway. These are Nebraska corn ears. And I'm glad you don't produce anything like this out here. These aren't horribly blunt. Uh, they came out of an experiment uh, this year, but I've learned how you do this. You break off plants at uh, V18, simulating green snap. Same kind of thing. Why is that happening? Because you're getting the blunt ears, uh, and, and early on, you, sometimes you see this little antenna sticking out like there. Um, before these, you could still see it here on these, these here. But uh, you know that cob length continues to increase through about blister stage. So anything you do that stresses that in between, say, V12 and blister, you could shorten the cob and, or the ear length, and that's what's happening here. And in my case, I knocked the tops off of those plants. But in that case, uh, there are other issues that can do that. Uh, fungicide applications at the wrong time, 2000, 2008. Anybody remember that? wasn't the fungicide, it was the adjuvant that we were putting on that resulted in that blunt ear syndrome. And there they are. That's from 0708, Gary Muckvold, a plant pathologist at Iowa State. Uh, 
pretty, I assume you guys have problems with that out here too. I know Iowa did. Applying fungicide, but it wasn't the fungicide again. We learned very quickly it was the adjuvant that was shortchanging and stressing that plant right at the wrong time before tasseling. Now, you were working into this really uh, fast growth stage. I'm going to try one more thing here. And if it doesn't work, Jeff, I'll just uh, say we should. We tried. Have you ever heard corn girl? Because this is a time, V12 up to tasseling time is when this is happening. Anybody ever hear it? Gosh, am I the only one? Oh, I'm, I'm seeing some nods. Okay. Well, we've got a uh, Justin McMacken and Doug Cook from, uh, is working in Saudi, or Abu Dhabi actually, uh, helped us put this together. So just, well, you can hear it growing there. I wish you could see it too. That's corn growing. I wish you could see it too, but you'll have to come up later and look at it. This, this is time lapse I'm looking at here that you can't see up there. Uh, in eight hours, it grows an inch and a quarter from V12 to tasseling. And that noise you heard was literally Doug Cook had his, had his stuff out there and was recording all that sound in the field. Once we get to uh, reproductive stages, it's not based on the vegetative appearance. It's, it's based on the ear appearance and the way the corn looks. Uh, the kernels, uh, there's six stages. We talked about that. Uh, soybeans got eight. Um, and R1 is silking. So keep those things in mind. If you look at this as you go across the span from, uh, from uh, uh, silking over there, R1, this is literally the size of the ears as they increase in size up to R6, which is uh, physiological maturity or black layer, which are almost the same, not quite. So 2016 was a record year in terms of uh, productivity. Uh, across the Corn Belt, I think Ohio and Nebraska were both a little short on yield, but Iowa beat uh, was over 200 bushels in their state average this year. So fantastic year in a lot of the Corn Belt. Uh, what I'm doing, gonna do here next is apply what we've learned about corn growth and development to the issues that we saw going on last year. So we saw all these symptoms of deformed ears and, and uh, we're doing a field survey and we're gonna do some research this year on it, but uh, I'll talk about what we're thinking right now, the ideas of why we had these problems or when we had those problems and, and how we're trying to approach those problems that we had last year. And we had all these issues last year. We first heard about it in, right after, uh, right after uh, uh, tasseling, right after silking in uh, the late July, and we wrote up this CropWatch article. Paul Yasa cited this, uh, this newsletter we have uh, just this morning in the main session, I think it was, but several of us got together. Jenny Reese was the uh, extension educator that brought it to our attention that we have a problem out there, and, and what can we do about it? So the, you know, our response is looking more down the road of how we can do the research that helps us prevent this in the future. So we talked about that. We had lots of different issues going on. Very quickly, that article went out on Friday, I think August 19th. By Monday, I had a, a call from a, a, a large sea company rep that I work with closely. And uh, he was saying, you know, the problem not only is in Nebraska, but it starts in the panhandle of Texas, goes up through eastern Colorado, across Nebraska, into Iowa and Illinois. So you guys were spared it the way it sounds based on the emails I had with Peter during the course of the year. I think Emerson, are you here? I think he talked about some issues up in Northwest Illinois. I know I, f I found some samples in Eastern in Iowa. So basically a widespread problem. Whenever you have a widespread problem like that, what's the first thing you think about? What's the issue? What are you thinking? Weather. Has to be the weather. And that's, that's our hypothesis, that's the idea we're going into this thinking about, but when we have a weather problem like this, you gotta know that they're already play, probably planting corn in Texas right now, and they were last year too. So it's probably not a single weather event. Uh, we just don't know what it is, and that's why we're starting, that's the questions we're asking right now. The other thing you'll know is that, the, you know, I talked about the razor's edge earlier, 
And guess which kind of hybrids were the most affected? The ones that are on the edge. Do you have another idea? What's your idea? More determinate the ones. Other ideas? Determinate? Possible? We don't. We haven't figured that out yet. Basically, uh, the, the ones that were most impacted were the racehorse hybrids. Ones that are sitting like that. And in a good year, you know, I remember a walk at the, one of the first fields I walked in. The farmer was saying, you know, this same hybrid last year did 300 bushels for me. We're irrigated central Nebraska, south central Nebraska. Irrigated conditions last year, this did 300. He said, I'll be lucky to make 190 this year. So he only lost a third of his yield. Only. Is that the difference between profit and no profit? I, I don't know. I'm not an economist. Mm -hmm. But what you've got to know is these hybrids have had wide testing across not only the Corn Belt, but around the, probably the country and the world for multiple years, thousands of locations, thousands of data points, and yet in 2016 they fall apart. So it was something unique about 2016 that resulted in these problems. So let's go through each one of these uh, symptoms that we had. The, the bouquet years is also uh, what uh, a lot of us, uh, I think that's the term that is in your uh, chart, uh, Peter. Uh, bouquet years, uh, multiple ear syndrome. Uh, the multiple ears form from a single stock node. Uh, stress, and what, what you've got to realize is that that shank that can be so weak at times and drop ears has also got inner nodes on it. It's got nodes, you're aware of that? Each one of those nodes can produce an ear. And that's what happens here. So each one of those shank nodes can produce an ear and sometimes you get five or six ears on a node like that one right there. It looks like four or five there. So what we know about, you know I told you about the, the shocks at V6 or so. Uh, Anytime between V6 and V12, we can knock off that primary ear. And the idea we have right now is that we're knocking off that primary ear sometime V6 to V12, and that results in, in the secondary ear taking over. And what we think, and we don't have solid proof on this, that these are secondary ear nodes. Knocked off the primary, the secondary ear comes in, and then we get multiple ears on that secondary ear node. That's what we're thinking. And it's possible that chilling temperatures during ear formation, the science has shown that that can happen. So we're, we're thinking that that's probably what happened there. You know, I've seen this before. Uh, Peter, you've seen it probably years before also. Um, Bob Nielsen's seen it. Uh, possible hypothesis, this cold shock that we talked about earlier. Uh, v V6 to V7, and, and it could be just one night is what we're talking about, and you brought that out. Um, could be a genetic thing, and in fact, it, there is, is very clearly a genetic interaction. In other words, the weather impact on specific hybrids can result in this issue. Barbell ears, there's some classic pictures over here. Those, those cobs in that midsection are, are, are pencil thin, really weak. Uh, and they, that, that barbell part can form in the middle or on the base like that. It could form mid-ear. Sometimes it forms at the tip of the ear like the diagrams uh, Justin put together there show. Um, very slender cob. Uh, just based on phenology here, it's probably V12 to tasseling is when that st a stress impacts that symptom. That's what we're thinking there in short term. Short husk, some ears protrude beyond the husk uh, and a potential, you know, that, you know, some ears do that and it helps in, in, in dry down, but it also results in lots of disease and insect problems and some bird damage can happen that way too. I assume your germination of the seed would be worse in ears like this too uh, that you saw earlier. So there's some interesting pictures coming up here. And this comes out of uh, off of, of of the webpage here on that, um, and it comes out of some really old work from Illinois, the Aldridge uh, book in '86. There, um, ex extreme drought prevailed during the time of veer set, followed by rainfall. So it could be something like that. That's what the old literature suggests. 
And that's timing before tasseling. The one thing it's told me is very clear, well, I never thought about this before, but the husk leaf elongation rate is independent of ear cob development rate. Husk leaf leaves develop independent of ear uh, of the cob itself. Does that make sense? How else could it happen? I never thought of it before, but that's one of my, well, that's rocket science, isn't it? Uh, that's what I think. Unlikely to be a single event that resulted in all three of these issues uh, because it crosses a wide geographic range. Planting date in many situations was very specific and important to whether the, the a hybrid showed these symptoms or not. Um, it's probably a cascade of events. One of the symptoms that I look for in fields is, is this, the height of the primary ear. And once I see a, a dropping down of that primary ear location, I start wondering why that happened. So I start asking those questions. And that's where sometimes you'll actually see the remnants of a, uh, an aborted ear uh, right above the ear that forms. Uh, you don't often see that. We call that a smoking gun. How's that for a literal term of you actually can see it? Sometimes you can feel that groove where the ear, primary ear was located. Sometimes you can't. But the fact that we have a lower note, uh, note height for that ear tells me something right away. So that's what I start thinking about. So the ear height can vary uh, depending on different things. Uh, you know, one of the pictures we saw earlier showed different uh, uh, inner node heights here. Um, our, like I said, most of our hybrids in probably years two are node 14 or 15 of, of where they're putting the ear on. And again, that is initiated at, at V5. And we learned earlier that uh, temperatures less than 50 can drop that primary ear node. And that's what we're thinking may have happened. In terms of uh, the uh, barbell type ears, uh, we've got a lot of good cooperators and people helping us think. John Mick is one of those out in central Nebraska. Uh, he took these pictures where the, uh, the ear, ear is actually uh, not elongating. So the shank isn't elongating enough and the ear is actually silking out and developing while it's still constricted by the sheath of the, of the leaf. So the leaf sheath, sheath is still constricting, much like my hand is on this remote. So the, a lot of the ear is still below that collar, and it somehow constricts the silk. We don't know if that's, uh, if that's part of the issue or not, but that, that's some observations that John had last year. So lack of uh, the shank internode elongation, which is an independent uh, growth, uh, growth thing. There's the area in Nebraska that we were hit with. Omaha is just about right here. Lincoln is right in the middle of Lancaster County, right there. Uh, this is the, largely the irrigated portion of Nebraska. I lived out here for 20 some years, so that's largely the irrigated portion of Nebraska. So we pulled at 16 locations. We pulled in 50 uh, to 100 plant samples, also sampled in Eastern Iowa. Uh, we cut the plants off at the ground. We measured about everything you could in the field, and then we carried them into the greenhouse, and we're still trying to s summarize that data. I'll show you some of that in a minute. Uh, one thing over here that uh, we have lost this data, but do you see this crease up and down? That seemed to be correlated in some cases, uh, but you know when we cut those plants in the field and drug them into the greenhouse, they all dried, and we, <laughs> the stock started splitting like that naturally. So we've lost that data, but next year, uh, if we have it again, we'll, we'll be certain to watch that. We measured all the inner node heights up to the ear node and beyond. Um, uh, anyway, it's not perfect science, and there's a lot of plants that remind me of the old uh, nursery tale about the, about the beautiful maiden up in a tower, and she has this big pile of uh, wheat there that she's spinning into gold every day. Is that what, Rapunzel? Is that the name of that story? Maybe you remember it. If you have grandkids, read that story again. But it's kind of like going to this greenhouse, see all this straw, and we're trying to turn it into golden data. Anyway, lots of people are helping. Tamara Jackson's our plant pathologist here. Um, 
One of the guy behind me there is Joe Kitchell, a corn breeder that's working on our teaching crew now. Lots of people helping. Tom Hogemeyer was one of those. Uh, so ear heights here. If you look at the samples that we've done uh, from left to right here, normal ear, multiple ear, uh, you know, multi uh, bouquet ears, abnormal ears, which are basically just stunted and, and nubbins. The short husks, there are two different types of short husk versions we've seen, two types of barbells that we've got in this data. The normal ear height is right there. Uh, so ear heights were shorter with the, uh, with the abnormal ears, with one exception over here. This is probably a little bit easier to understand over here. The average ear node on a normal one was 12.9, so we've got several hundred plants in this sample. We aren't done yet. We're still sampling and, and monitor, measuring plants. But uh, about 13th node there, and as you go down to uh, the multiple ears, we're about a full node shorter. So we have lost a primary ear node in those cases, or at least the ear node is set lower. And that's true on most of the abnormals. In terms of grain weight per ear, this is what we ended up with, with this uh, preliminary data. Normal ear is about 180 grams, so it should be about just short of a half a pound. And you compare that to the multiple ear ones that really essentially did nothing uh, versus the abnormals here and the various types of short husks. The two types, this, the, the 75 would have 75% of, of the cob uh, covered with husk, and the 50 would be 50% of it covered with husk, and the two types of barbell ears. So dramatic yield reduction. So my friend that said he lost a third of his yield uh, probably did in those parts of the field for sure. Oops. I may have trouble here now. Next, I need to go next. Maybe I can do it this way. There I go. All right, so a couple of hypotheses, then I'll be wrapping up here. Uh, June 7th, what we're looking at is when the corn was before V6, around V6, the minimum temperature departure from mean on June 7th, uh, the green, uh, the darkest green is minus 10 degrees below normal. And what we're talking about there is Nebraska right there. Minus 10 degrees below normal on the 7th of June. And on the 8th of June, we're already up to normal. So that's why I was getting back to the point what it seems like one night may be implicated in dropping that primary ear node. We're still sorting through data. And I'll tell you a little bit more in, in a minute on that. All right, let's move up to uh, June 18th through the middle of June. And what happened is that we went actually the opposite way, where we went warmer than normal. And then uh, in July 1 to July 4th, back down to below normal again. The darkest green on this, this chart here is minus, six, uh, minus 9 degrees below normal. So huge swings in temperature that the corn was subjected to at very critical times. V6, V7 originally, and then V12 to, to tasseling, which would be the, the charts here on on the right. Okay, so July 1 specifically, uh, look at the temperature, average temperature departure from mean. Uh, Nebraska is here, this blue part, the darkest blue there would be minus 15 below normal. So very cool in early July. And if you march that across the days, the next day it was very cold right in here, and that's where my other, or other set of problems occurred that that I'm aware of. So in summarizing, the internode lakes did differ with uh, the ear type. The uh, average ear height was below normal. Uh, significant yield impact on individual ears and abnormal fields. Some, some guys lost a, uh, half their yield. Um, we're collecting the remaining plant data and we're going to correlate that with severity. We uh, just this just a week ago yesterday, a, a visiting scientist came from China, and, and what we hope that she will do is put her arms around all this weather data because that's the that's the trigger point, and try to understand uh, what happened, where and when. So these are the variables that you have to think about because all of these variables affected. Uh, 
affected response. I guess we don't have too much data on, on road direction affecting it yet. Uh, we think solar radiation is part of the problem, but uh, most of these things we've ruled out except for planting date of specific hybrids. Tillage, uh, we've had one, one guy that planted uh, the same hybrid in two fi different fields one day, the same day, uh, was, uh, with no till and with tilled, and one field was affected, the other one wasn't. So different development stages at precisely the wrong time resulted in problems. So part of, part of my conclusion here is that knowing, and almost the last slide, knowing that normal corn growth and development will help you diagnose problems as they happen, in many cases, make management changes. So that, that's, but those management changes are probably going to be next year because you can't do much about it once they happen. And since the environment dri drives a large share of what we're happening, I think we need to employ resilient and diverse management systems to avoid risk. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And that's, that's a tendency we have to do as we try to simplify, as the previous speaker talked about, uh, we, we try to make things simple and at the same time we're making ourselves more vulnerable for problems like this to happen. 